listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocus Radio. We are here once again today. We have another awesome show lined up for y'all today. We have a true honor talking to our special guest. Her name is Dr. Michelle Maidenberg. She has an amazing website you can visit. It's michellemaidenberg.com. She has a book that she put out uh, not too long ago. It was back until 2022, but it's still fresh. It's Ace Your Life, Unleash Your Best Self, and Live a Life You Want. And we're going to learn everything about what she does. She does a lot of great things, but she has a very impressive resume. I want to have her do the honors to kind of give us a backstory of herself. Welcome to the show, Dr. Michelle Maidenberg. How are you doing? Thank you so much. The book actually came out in 23, just saying. (laughs) Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. No problem. It's all the same, right? The the years are blending in these days. I don't know. (laughs) That's what it feels like, right? Yes. So So nice to be here. Yes, ma'am. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So um, I practice and I live in Westchester County in New York. Um, I have four children from 23 to 15, which is absolutely mind boggling to me. (laughs) Um, I uh, work as a therapist. I have a private practice. I also have a nonprofit, which is called Through My Eyes, T-H-R-U. And it is, it offers free clinically guided videotaping for chronically medically ill individuals who want to leave a video legacy for their children and loved ones. Um, I have a YouTube channel, which publishes weekly guided meditations. I teach at NYU, a class on mindfulness um, in a graduate program. And what else? Um, and I'm a blogger for Psychology Today. And I recently, I, I publish on the average, I would say every three weeks or so. And I recently published an article called Eight Ways to Directly Transform Your Triggers, Tips to Improve to Vastly Improve Your Relationships. So that just came out. And that's me. So tell us a little bit about your practice. Uh, I know that's based in uh, Harrison, New York. Okay. Tell us a little bit how that vision got started. My practice, it really has more to do because people always say like, who do you work with and what do you do? So it really has more to do with the treatment that I provide, you know, more than the, I would say, you know, the types of people that I treat. So I do a whole bunch of different treatments. One is um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which most people kind of know about because it's very evidence-based. Something called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is uh, ACT. And then something called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And I do a whole bunch of other things, a lot of mindfulness, um, a lot of polyvagal theory, you know, some structural family therapy. So it's really, I would say, a conglomerate of all of those things. It's a mix and match depending on what a person needs when they come to see me. Um, I absolutely, absolutely love what I do. Um, I'm very passionate about working with people and helping them to make life change and really to live the life they want and living their best self. And the model that I came up with, which is based on my book, which is Ace Your Life, Unleash Your Best Self and Live the Life You Want, is predicated, ACE stands for acceptance, compassion, and empowerment. So the idea is if you do embrace and integrate all of those facets in your life, you will be living the life you want and your best self and you'll be your best self. And speaking of becoming your best self, I mean, self-help has been very popular lately. It's a hot topic. It's something that is on every show, every podcast show, and many books Mm -hmm. nowadays. But when it comes to having a very mindfulness uh, way of living a person's life, how Mm -hmm. do you unpack that with people that you help? So that's also a great question. You know, people don't... Some people get confused. You know, there's a lot of myths and kind of confusion around mindfulness. People are like, what is that? Do I need to sit on a cushion? And, you know, I can't, you know, quiet my mind. So it's not for me, right? People, you know, say all different kinds of things about mindfulness. So mindfulness, meditative practice is a type of mindfulness. So I really want to make that distinction. There's a thousand and one ways that you could you know, uh, integrate mindfulness into your life and into your practice, a daily practice. And meditative practice could be one, you know, there's all different kinds of practices, exercises you could do. There's, you know, walking meditations, 
there's yoga, you know, there's more active physical, you know, types of activities and exercises you could do. Um, but the, the nuance behind it and what you're trying to accomplish really is slowing down your mind. And the reason for that is because we're constantly, just because we're so busy and we're, you know, multitasking and we're constantly inundated and we really don't have time to really slow down our mind. And, you know, when we have impulsive behaviors, we make, you know, kind of poor decisions. It's typically because there's not really space between the thinking and doing. We kind of go on overdrive, we go into automatic, we're not in our conscious awareness. So the more that you practice to really slow down your mind, the more conscious you're going to be of, you know, your behaviors. And, you know, again, when we're, when we're kind of going day to day, you know, if we're not slowing down, we can really make decisions that really don't work in our best interest. And sometimes they're really not healthy. So it's, you know, it's really advisable to slow down and to really have more of a mindful based living if you could do it. Um, and anyone could do it, by the way. <laughs> it only takes a couple of minutes a day to practice. Um, and, and I'll just give you a personal example. Uh, it just happened the other day where I had a person, you know, I had kind of an, you know, a um, interaction with somebody and I had really strong feelings that came up, you know, negative feelings. And my go-to place when I was younger would be to lash out because I was frustrated. I was angry. I was hurt. I was wounded. And I wouldn't give necessarily the person the benefit of the doubt because in my mind, the way that I was perceiving what happened was the end all and be all. And it was the right way and the right thing. And, you know, yesterday, like I said, there was this interaction I had and I definitely had these triggers that came up and I, you know, and I felt them. It was like so clear that I was being activated. And, you know, because I've learned to slow down my mind, I took that time to say to myself, you know what, I need to check in with myself. Like I need to check in if these expectations are realistic, you know, if I'm perceiving this the right way, if the person's intention may be different than the way I'm perceiving it right now in this moment. Um, And instead of overreacting, right, or reacting in a way that wasn't going to be in my best interest or the way I wanted to be, I really took the time. And it's like, you know, a day and a half later, and it's so much clearer to me, like, why I was activated and what came up for me and really being curious about the other person's intentions and everything. And I'm going to actually have a talk with that person in the next day. And I know that when I interact with them, I'm going to completely be my best self. And I'm going to talk in a very vulnerable, connected, you know, way, which makes me feel very proud of myself. And it really increases my confidence, you know, when I'm in that mindful space. We're talking to our guest today, Dr. Michelle Maidenberg. And speaking of that, I mean, that's a great thing to unpack there because when it comes to managing our emotions, I mean, Mm -hmm. on any good day, just get in traffic, just let one more car cut you off, just let one more text or email come through. I mean, at what point did it, not to say it got easier for you, but it got better for you and how you were able to be prepared to manage uh, those situations? That's a good question. So it's a work in progress. <laughs> so I am so much better these days. And I really, really, I could see my progress, you know, on a daily basis. And I'm, I, I'm really proud of myself, but I have my moments just like everybody else. Right. And sometimes I may overreact or I may, but it's, so different than it used to be because a, you know, it takes me a lot. It takes a lot more to get me to that space. Number one, number two, I'm so much more in cognizant and aware of my thoughts, my feelings, my bodily sensations. So I don't readily go there. And then when I do, I'm able to catch it, which is amazing. But like I said, there are times where I get, you know, you know, if it's kind of over the top and something that really, really kind of activates me. And actually the thing that happened the other day which was very interesting. And I, again, because I was curious and I took a step back, I was able to notice this. I realized that my reaction had to do with something cumulative. What does that mean? I had an interaction with the person the day before and something happened and I kind of repressed it. I didn't really consider how it affected me. And I also didn't realize how it affected me. And then when something happened the day after, my feelings exponentially increased and were so, so, so intense because I had that, you know, situation happen the day before. And when I kind of took a step back and really thought about it, I was like, oh, 
Like that second thing that happened wasn't such a big deal, but the reason why I had that strong reaction was because it was cumulative, right? It was like the thing that happened the day before, the thing that happened today. Um, and I had to kind of piece it out and realize like that I had, I had to really think about where both of those things or how both of those things affected me and recognize that maybe I wasn't feeling as intensely, I guess, wounded, if you want to call it, <laughs> as I thought I was, but the cumulative effects of it, having two things all at once, that overwhelmed me. Does that make sense? Definitely makes sense. And yeah. if someone listening to this right now and they're like, you know, it's not that I don't want to. I just never yeah. took the time to, I guess you say, pause to yeah. actually try it. What are some recommendations or exercises that you can give our listeners that they can practice this so that they can, in the future, just deal with things a little bit better? Sure. So there's tons of things you could do. And um, my book, for example, um, that's why I wrote it, because I wanted to give you, you know, skills and tools and tips, you know, um, to be able to take along with you so that you could, you know, kind of be more mindful in, in, in that space. So, you know, it, it you have to really build up to it. You know, um, it doesn't happen automatically. And the space that I'm speaking to took me quite a while, you know, to be able to get to the space where I'm able to really kind of quiet myself down and, and really think about it like strategically. So you have to practice. It really takes a lot, a lot of practice. And even, you know, yesterday when I was talking to that person, they said to me, you know, they notice because I'm a very facial person. They're like, what's going on with you? Like, you're kind of acting weird. And I knew that I was feeling really angry and frustrated and, you know, wounded. And 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 I said to myself, this is not the right time to have this conversation. It's not going to go well because I'm not going to really behave in the way that I want to. So um, I gave myself that grace. I gave myself that time. And I told the person, I really do want to explain to you what's going on. But like, I want time to think about this and process it. But I really appreciate the fact that you're that you have patience and that you're giving me that space. That really is meaningful to me. And I really appreciate that about you. So offering that gift, right? When I was able to communicate, it, it even helped the relationship too. So, like I said, practicing it, you know, when you feel and first study yourself. Okay. So my go-to place I know is I start, I literally feel like fires coming out of my head. <laughs> I get like a hot face. I get like my, my heart rate is beating really quickly. Um, I become extremely, I go to frustration and anger. That's my thing. Like I go right there, you know, and I feel the rumble in my chest. So right away when I feel that way, because I've studied myself so much, I know I need time to think like, this is not a good time really to react. And in the past, I used to see myself as mean because I didn't act the way I wanted to be acting. I acted from an angry, frustrated place. And now I don't see myself as mean anymore. I actually have such confidence in myself and I see myself as a thoughtful, caring, nurturing person, you know, that sometimes has aggressive feelings and thoughts, but that doesn't make me a mean or aggressive person. And that's a big difference too. So the way we speak to ourselves, you know, and witnessing that. How are we speaking? Are we being nurturing? Are we being self-compassionate? Are we being demeaning? Are we being, you know, insulting and criticizing? You know, so we have to also monitor that. So, you know, those are a couple of tips. Like I said, if uh, if you get my book, you'll get tons and tons of them. Um, but there's a lot of things you could be doing on a daily basis every day. You also teach a graduate course at NYU. Tell us a little bit about that and what that course is all about. Sure. So it's integrating mindfulness into clinical practice and it's for graduate students and it's all the, all the individuals, the cohort of students are actually going to be, you know, mental health professionals in some realm, uh, hopefully, or maybe not, but they're getting a graduate degree for it. So uh, one thing that's really important and it, it's so interesting, every time I teach that course, the students, the feedback I always get, they're like, oh my goodness, everybody who's working, you know, with other people, whether it's physicians, you know, attorneys, mental health professionals, whatever the case is, they're like, they should take this course. It's so important. Oh my goodness, they should take this. Um, because it's teaching others, you know, it's teaching others in your practice, you know, how to be mindful. Um, so, and also when they are working with others, when they're working with clients, when they're working with, 
you know, patients at a hospital, whatever the case is, that they will be mindful when they're interacting with their clients. Because as practitioners, it's important to be sensitive to that, obviously, right? You want to model those skills and also you want to be a respectful practitioner, you know? So um, it's it's a pleasure, pleasure for me to, you know, to teach. I love teaching and I love, um, you know, the students are just, you know, open and eager to learn and they're just absolutely wonderful. When you look at your career and everything you have been able to accomplish for yourself professionally, what are some of the things that you look back on and say, you know what, I'm glad I went through that because it prepared me for this moment? That's a good question. Um, I have to, it's so funny what came up for me. No one ever asked me that question, <laughs> but I really like it. Um, I'll never forget my first internship in graduate school was working for uh, Veterans Administration. And it was in um, Brooklyn, <laughs> New York which is, you know, could be a tough population. Um, But I I just remember I had this client and he was really trying to test me, you know, really getting under my skin. And he went to town. He insulted every inch of me, like literally he insulted the fact that I was white. He insulted the fact that I was Jewish. He insulted the fact that I was a woman. I mean, he like went for the gusto and I sat there and I was like this little peon, you know, in my 20, like, early twenties or whatever the case is. And I remember sitting there and I was just like petrified, <laughs> you know, thinking like, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do with all this, you know? And, and, and I could feel how insulted I felt based on what he was saying to me. Cause it was very insulting. It was trying to get under my skin. And I decided that, you know, I was going to be kind to him and compassion no matter what, because he was looking for something for me. And it was obvious that he was trying to test me in some way, you know, that he could trust me and I could trust him and all that. And I didn't, I I didn't, I I really was very calm. And I said to him, wow, you have really strong feelings. And I wonder what it's like to sit here with me, considering everything you just said is all about me, you know? And it was so funny because he stopped and he goes, you didn't react to me. I go, no. I mean, I have feelings about what you said, but, you know, I respect, you know, everybody has a right to their opinion and their feelings. And he's like, that is so cool. He's like, I really tried to get under your skin and you didn't let, you know, you, you handled that really well. (laughs) And he went on and on. And after that, he was so cool with me and he trusted me and we had a great relationship. Um, But I think the point that I'm making is just being with somebody's pain or agony or woundedness or whatever the case is and being very authentic. And that's one of the, that's the feedback I get from like many, many of my clients is that they find that I'm very authentic. And that is the best compliment I could get. So I think really making sure that I'm always practicing with integrity and with um, authenticity has been really, really important to me. That's a great story because it leads up to this question. Um, okay. When it comes to having self acceptance of ourselves, I mean, I mean that's a journey in itself. But how have you, throughout your life journey, been able to master that? Mm-hmm. So, the power is in the doing, and I cannot say that enough. So, a lot of my work is also around values. Um, and in a chapter of my book, I have a whole chapter actually around values. And I, I, I also, you know, walk you through an exercise on how to establish what your values are. Cause a lot of people don't know, they think they know what their values are, but when they do my exercise, uh, you know, sometimes they're surprised. And, um, when, you know, when you're in touch and for myself, when I was very, very clear what my values are. And when I make it a point on a daily basis to lean into them in the way that I want to, and I give myself accolades and I notice and I, you know, um, really make it a point, you know, to acknowledge my accomplishments and my success that builds and fortifies confidence and self-acceptance. And, you know, I'll just, I'll give you another example. You know, one of the things also that I guess I grapple with, you know, on a personal level is sometimes I could kind of feel like I'm too much. And I know a lot of people feel that way. And why do I feel like I'm too much? I feel like I'm too much because I'm a very, very emotional person. I'm an empath. 
and I feel feelings on such a deep level. You know, I am like extremely compassionate and thoughtful and, you know, um, and for some people who are in relationships with me, that's a lot, right? Um, so I know I'm not for everyone. Let's put it that way. And that's part of something. So I used to feel that I'm too much. And that used to make me feel unworthy in some respects. And now it just happened this morning where I was, I was feeling a little sad, you know, about something. And I said to myself, I'm not too much. I am just right. And, you know, I'm going to have relationships in my life and I'm going to connect to people who are going to be appreciative and, you know, loving and nurturing of that part of me. And, um, and that's because I so value and appreciate that part of me. So like, I'm the person who like opens the door for others. I'm the person who says, God bless you. I'm the person who like helps just the other day I was in the park, you know, and there was a family from out of town. You could tell they were at a foreign accent or whatever the case is. And they were, and they had one of those selfie sticks, you know, then they're taking like a family picture, but they were having such a hard time, you know, they were trying to manipulate the phone and whatever. And I went right up to them and I'm like, do you want me to take that picture? Like, you know, you look like you're struggling a little bit. It's going to come out better if you have somebody else take it. They were so delighted. They were like, thank you so much. It's so nice. And let me tell you, there were like tons of people walking by them. Nobody went over to them, <laughs> you know? So when I do stuff like that, I actually take a moment and I like, I give myself credit for, you know, doing something that's leaning into my value of thoughtfulness. So if somebody came over to me and said, oh, Michelle, you're not so thoughtful, I would laugh at them because I know in my gut that I am thoughtful. And what leads me to my thoughtfulness is my my ability to tap into my emotions and being an empath and being emotionally sensitive. So I have accepted that part of me and embraced that part of me because it also serves me really well and it really leads me to being the person I want to be. So that's just like an example of kind of self-acceptance. It's funny you said that story because remind me the time I was um I was in New York for just touring or whatever and went to the One World Trade Center and when I did a tour there it's like everywhere. Everyone from all around the world speaking different languages, everything. And I remember there was a couple, they were struggling to try to do their own selfie and I noticed that. It's like, well, I know they are speaking like foreign language I don't know if they can speak English I don't know if I should just go there and be like hey I can take your picture and yeah. then they just kept struggling and so <laughs> I finally went over and I just like I did a motion with my cell phone it was like picture and their <laughs> face just beamed and yeah. I think that's a great story because it's a great point but it's it's those little things like yeah. it doesn't even take much right exactly and that's what I'm getting at like it doesn't take much and a lot of things that people do appreciate is more common than we think. The values of life, you know, how we treat oh, people, yeah. how we see people. We all have like our professional voice and then we have our friend's voice and our family's voice. We won't talk to professionals the way we talk to our family and friends and vice versa. Oh, yes. Well, I always say if we spoke to our family members like we spoke to our friends, we'd be in good shape, right? We don't do that. Right. <laughs> like I actually, I make a joke with my kids sometimes and I'm like, would you talk to your friend like that? And they laugh, you know, because <laughs> right. I said, guess what, sweetie, you wouldn't have many friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they laugh, you know, it kind of breaks up the conversation, but they laugh when I say that, you know, <laughs> Exactly. Um, and then and then it's funny. But all of a sudden, like, you know, she, my daughter's 15. So, you know how that is. Right. So like when I say something like that to her, all of a sudden she, you know, she kind of like stops and says, oh, yeah, that's kind of not nice. I'm being kind of rude, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, the issue is sometimes is when we're communicating with family members or people that we feel comfortable with, you know, we lose ourselves. We're not really, you know, we may not be as patient, we may not be as respectful, we may not be as mindful, you know, like we're talking about um, because we take it for granted and we're just. We're almost like, if you think about it, we're completely, completely not in like our conscious mind, you know, and we're acting from impulses and from like a place that is just so subconscious. Um, so that's the benefit, you know, again, talking about mindfulness, that's the benefit of mindfulness when you do really, if you, if you are in that mindful space, you will be cognizant of that no matter who you're talking to. 
And that's, that's really changed for me. I have to tell you, um, because I know, you know, sometimes I could be, you know, like all of us, like, you know, we're, we, we don't have our guard up. We're not like so patient and calm, you know, when we're talking to our family, if they kind of annoy us or frustrate us, we'll talk in an annoying or frustrating voice, like you said. Yeah. Um, but, and, and losing sight that we're in a relationship that needs to be nurtured by, you know, mutual respect. Um, and when there isn't that mutual respect, it detrimentally affects the relationship. I don't care who it's with. So uh, it's worth practicing no matter what, you know, and I, I really, really try to teach my kids that a lot, um, that it doesn't matter who you're talking to, like you have to be respectful and you're being respectful for the other person. But more importantly, you're being respectful for yourself because that has to do with your integrity. It has to do with your confidence. It has to do the, with the way you see yourself when you're talking to others. That's good. Once again, talking to our guest, uh, Dr. Michelle Maidenberg. You can go to her website. It's real easy. It's her name, michellemaidenberg.com. You can get her book. It is available right now. Ace Your Life, Unleash Your Best Self, and Live the Life You Want. We've been talking about mindfulness. We've been talking about managing emotions. We've been talking about a lot of things. But before we let you go, what's the best way that you want audience to take away from this episode? You know, <laughs> only because of everything that's going on in the world right now. <laughs> um, you know, just to not take for granted, you know, the relationships that we're in, I would say. You know, life is so fleeting and it's so quick. And, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, because of the position I'm in as a therapist, I see a lot, a lot of human adversity, right? Deaths and violence and racism and just things that are just so heartbreaking and um, inhumane sometimes. And I'm going to just say, we only have one life to live one. And it's so quick, you know, from one moment to the next, like do whatever you can on a moment to moment basis to really be your best self. So people go to your website, uh, Michelle Maidenberg. They can also check out your other books that you've written. You haven't just written one. You have many Thank other you. books you have. And they can read your blogs as well. What yes. can people uh, do if they are in New York and they are a good uh -huh. fit to connect with you with your services? Sure. They could always, you know, go to, the best thing is to go to my website because you could always connect, uh, you know, through my website. You could email me um, or, you know, and contact me via phone. So there's there's a lot of ways. I do have um, a weekly guided meditation on, a, on my YouTube channel. So you could subscribe to that. It gets published every Thursday at around 11 a.m. And I also, on um, Psychology Today, I'm a blogger. So I do have articles that come up periodically. Um, and, you know, my book has all the skills and tools, you know, that I spoke about. And I'm always happy to be of help to anybody. Yeah. Once again, we've been talking to Dr. Michelle Maidenberg on Army Focus Radio. I want to say thanks again for your time. You're welcome. Nice to meet you.